In this lecture, we're going to take a step back and uh, uh, take a, a broader look at some of these concepts we've been covering so far. So this will not be uh, about implementation details, but more uh, thinking a bit uh, about these representations that we've been learning inside the, the network, uh, what we can expect from them, why they should work, and what their use uh, can be. So this is the, the focus of this part of representation learning. Also, I'll try to make this uh, lecture a bit shorter because um, we, uh, we need more time for questions at this stage of the semester. So from now on, I'll try to leave more time for questions after the lectures. So let's start with the, the motivation for learning good representations. We know that, that features are very important, not only in machine learning, but in general. For instance, imagine trying to do um, algebraic operations using Roman numerals. Uh, it's very hard. We, we have to do everything by uh, mentally, practically. But if we use uh, Arabic numerals as we usually do, then it's much simpler to uh, def uh, devise algorithms for adding long numbers, dividing, multiplying, and so on. In machine learning, this is also true. Uh, those of you who already had uh, machine learning know that uh, if we have good features, then it makes a big difference relative to having features that, that uh, provide a, a poor representation of the data. So one of the big things about deep learning that we've been seeing so far is that we can imagine deep networks as stacked feature extractor, extractors that learn to find the appropriate features, the good features to represent the data in order to simplify whatever task we have at the end, classification, regression, so on. So we could uh, even, uh, after training a neural network, just throw away the final part of the network, the, the head that does the classification, and then use those features and feed them into a support vector machine, a naive base classifier, something like that. Uh, it wouldn't matter because uh, in theory now we have a good representation of the data, and so it's much easier to use whatever machine learning algorithm that we want with that representation. So this is the idea here. Um, uh, representation learning will be learning to represent the data in a useful way that can help us then with uh, other tasks. And note that uh, we can uh, already intuitively see that if we can find a good representation of the data, then this will simplify whatever tasks that we want to perform uh, afterwards. Regression, classification, clustering, whatever we want to do. If the, if the representation is better, everything becomes easier. Uh, and also we can solve specific problems like, for example, overfitting. If we have a small amount of data, especially if it has lots of features and a poor representation, then we need a complex model uh, to try to figure out how to uh, work with that data, for example, to classify it. But if we have a small amount of data on a complex model and a powerful model, we will only get overfitting. If we start by obtaining a good representation of the data, for example, manually extracting features, that would be one approach. Now we can use a much simpler model and avoid overfitting, even though we still don't have much data. But if we can do this uh, initial step of extracting the appropriate features automatically, if we can learn, train some model to do this automatically, then uh, we would get uh, the same result without having to do all the work ourselves. And one important thing here is that uh, unsupervised learning can help us find the right features. We saw examples of that with autoencoders. And usually when we don't have much data, that may be because we don't have much labeled data for whatever problem we're trying to solve, but we may have lots of unlabeled data. And so unsupervised and semi-supervised learning can help us uh, extract the correct features and then solve the problem of having a uh, few examples with the labels to train the final model. So this would be the motivation for finding good representations. But now the question is, what is a good representation and why should we be able to find it? Uh, now, if uh, I'm just going to give a, a brief overview of some of the topics. I would recommend reading this, uh, this paper uh, because it's, it's a good discussion 
at this more abstract level of, uh, of these concepts. But one thing, uh, we know that uh, even though we have data in high dimensions, for instance, images, we know that the data is not uniformly distributed over the whole space in which we have. In fact, it can be very, very far from that. So imagine that you generate images by randomly assigning colors to each pixel. It's nearly impossible that you'll get an image of a cat or a dog or something like that that way because the amount of images that are completely rubbish and don't mean anything is hugely superior to the number of images that actually where we can see something meaningful there so uh, if whatever uh, image classification problem you're dealing with the subspace where your data actually can be found is much, much smaller than the, the space of all possible images. And so if you can find this manifold, this lower dimensional space where your, uh, your images uh, lie, then you can find a much better representation of your data than just the set, the matrices of, of pixels. Uh, another thing is that usually data in real life, the examples, are characterized by combinations of factors that are not dependent uh, of each other. Uh, so going back to images as a, as a, a simple example, uh, the features that uh, uh, allow you to, uh, to see if it's a cat do not depend on where they occur in the image as long as they occur in the correct relative position. So if you have an ear and, a, and a, a nose and things like that spread out through all the image, then probably that is no longer a cat, if it ever was. But uh, if it's in the right relative position, it doesn't matter if they are on the top of the image or the bottom or things like that. So different uh, attributes like position, shape, size, orientation, color, texture, and so on, may occur independently in your, uh, in your data. And so uh, a good representation would be able to disentangle, to separate these features so that it can uh, examine or discard uh, them independently. And uh, image uh, classification is a good example for this because uh, if you just look at the pixels, you cannot really separate things like orientation and position and size by looking at each pixel individually. There is no pixel for size and no pixel for orientation. But if you convert the representation of the image into these kinds of parameters, then you can do this uh, disentanglement between the different relevant aspects of your data. Also, uh, these uh, factors that we can use to explain the data or to, to understand the data tend to be uh, hierarchically organized. Going again, uh, using again images as an example, you can have a lower level uh, in the hierarchy, which consists of simple edge detection, some texture patterns and so on, and then increase uh, in the abstraction level until you, you reach the shape of a body, the, the number of legs, the, the size of the, uh, uh, the type of face, things like that. So um, this is usually present in the data, but it's not present in the way the data is given to us uh, in general. So if you, if you receive the images as matrices of red, green and blue intensities, you do not see this hierarchy of features in that representation. But if you convert that into a, a set of, of uh, feature maps obtained by different detectors at different levels in your network, then you get a, a hierarchical representation of these uh, different aspects. So this is another reason why we think that uh, creating a different representation of the data may improve things, uh, make it uh, the data better for our particular uses. Uh, another uh, important aspect here is that usually unlabeled data is more abundant than labeled data. But if it's from the same data set, the structure is still there, regardless of whether you have labels or not. So it should be possible to increase a lot the, the uh, number of examples that you can use when you are just looking at the structure of the data to find a good representation before moving on to trying to solve your actual problem of classification, regression, or something like that where you need the labels.
Uh, another thing that is very important when we find good representations is that usually the important factors for representing data can be transferred from one problem to the other. Um, so in image recognition, if you have detectors for different textures, different patterns, different edges and so on, you can use the same detectors in a different problem. This is what you did last week when you transferred the model uh, trained on fashion NIST to solve the uh, classification problem on the NIST dataset. Even though the, the digits and the cartoons of the pieces of clothes are different kinds of data, the important, the basic representations that are useful in one case tend to also be useful in the other. And so you can uh, use the same extractors to get the, uh, those features in the other data set. Um, it's also important to note that uh, the, um, each example may only be uh, contained uh, some relevant features and uh, others may not be relevant. So you can imagine that if you were identifying each feature as a zero or one uh, label, for each example, you would have mostly zeros and only a, a few ones. This is something that we saw uh, explicitly in sparse autoencoders, but uh, you can think of it in general uh, because uh, those useful features generally can help us distinguish between different examples and uh, so they appear in some examples and uh, not others. And this uh, is something that is generally not the case on the original data that we have. Um, sometimes it is and, and too much, so sparsity may be good in some cases, maybe bad in others. For example, suppose that you are uh, categorizing documents uh, or uh, emails or tweets, something like that and you create large vectors of zeros and ones indicating if any particular word is present or not. You would have a very sparse representation, but with a huge dimensionality, and that would not be very convenient. So um, the controlling sparsity in uh, obtaining good representations is something tricky, and it's a, a, another aspect where we can find a difference between usually how the data is obtained and what we would like uh, the data to be. Another important uh, uh, thing to consider it is that usually the function we are trying to learn, uh, for example, for classifying or regression or some of those problems, uh, should be smooth. Uh, that is, if we have um, similar inputs, we should get a similar output. We should not get a very large variation of the output from similar inputs. However, if we have to learn from data that has, uh, does not have a good representation, usually the complexity of, a mo of the model necessary to do uh, that learning will tend to make it very sensitive to small variations in the, in the input. And this will lead, for example, to overfitting. On the other hand, if we have a good representation, then we do not need to make the model so responsive to small variations in the input because the input is already capturing the important features and now we can make everything smoother and uh, uh, reduce overfitting, lower the sensitivity to the training set and so on. Uh, so if we have a good representation, this can improve uh, in this aspect. So basically, uh, if we can capture the correct features from our data, uh, we can extract those useful features from our data. We have a representation that not only has these attributes of being more robust, of being easier to use for uh, whatever purpose, classification, regression, and so on, but we also uh, can reuse these feature extractions in different problems, even with different data, as long as the kinds of features are similar. So um, this allows us to reuse whatever we learned in one data set uh, to different data sets. Um, if we are using supervised learning, then the features are learned by the hidden layers in our network in order to help minimize the, the loss function. In unsupervised learning, for example, with autoencoders, it's the same thing because uh, we also have this loss function and we're trying to minimize. But the difference is now that we are just focusing on the distribution of the input values 
regardless of what labels we may or may not want to use in the future. In the, the future. Uh, in any case, this distribution already gives us a lot of information about the desirable features. So if you recall, for example, the, the encoding of the banknotes data set uh, with an under-complete autoencoder to reduce to two dimensions already gives us a distribution of the points that makes it much easier to classify uh, that data. So that would be an example of using the distribution of the inputs without looking at the labels to obtain a better representation for uh, uh, subsequent um, approaches like classification, regression, and so on. Okay, so let's look at some historical, uh, one historical tech, uh, important technique uh, for training uh, neural networks. This was unsupervised pre-training of uh, uh, layers on the network. This is no longer uh, very used because now we can train deep networks in one go, but uh, uh, it's a good example to see how this uh, learning of these representations, the impact it has on the network, and uh, there are some applications where pre-training can be uh, still useful. So basically the idea here was because of the uh, um, vanishing gradients problem, it was very difficult to train a neural network, a deep neural network from the start. So one technique was to start from the first layer of the, the network and train it as an autoencoder. We would add a, a decoding layer and gen then just feed in the input and try to reconstruct it into the output. Typically, this would be a denoising autoencoder so that the, uh, this hidden layer would have to learn how to rebuild, reconstruct the, the inputs from the corrupted uh, instances. Uh, but we would just train it as a very shallow autoencoder. And once, once this is done, we can discard the decoding layer and just use the encoder, encoding as the input to the second layer. And again, train the second layer in our network as a single, uh, a simple shallow autoencoder that tries to recreate the output of the first layer. And then do the same thing for the third layer, the fourth layer, and so on. So we start by pre-training in an unsupervised manner each of the layers of the network. And afterwards, we bring them all together and just fine-tune everything with backpropagation. So this was a, a, a good way to... Uh, go around the problem of uh, uh, vanishing gradients. But um, nowadays, this is no longer necessary because if you use rectified linear units and things like that, then you no longer need uh, to, to do this kind of pre-training. But this um, still has some regularization e effect because when, when you initialize your network at random, you are starting at different uh, spots on the, uh, the overall space of parameters than what you do if you initialize it uh, with uh, unsupervised pre-training, for example. Uh, and learning the distribution of the inputs helps guide the networks to finding the right features. So um, you, can, you can see here, uh, for instance, uh, in the cases of having very uh, poor representations of the data, uh, for example, suppose that you have um, the representation of documents as one hot uh, encoding of, of different words um, or uh, just having zeros and ones to indicate different words and so on. You can have a very high dimensional input like that, but it's mostly zeros. And every time you have one hot uh, representations, for example, of, of categorical uh, um, features, then uh, all of those vectors will be uh, at the same distance of one another. So suppose that you have one feature in your data that has uh, 30 different possibilities, you encode it as a one-hot uh, encoded vector of 30 positions with a one, and all of the different possibilities in that feature will be at the same distance of one from all the others. So um, this would not be very informative for uh, whatever model you're trying to train. And so trying to compute an embedding, which is the, uh, a dense representation, more compact representation with continuous values from these uh, zero one representations that are uh, much larger and much sparser can be very useful. So this is uh, an example uh, 
there was this uh, uh, set of examples for uh, actions, for human actions, that are the results of sensors, motion sensors, that people were wearing as they did uh, different things, like sitting down, walking, things like that. Um, and these were, each example was very sparse. So there are uh, 5,000 readings, but most of them are zero, and only around 2% would be non-zero. Uh, but training the uh, denoising autoencoder with regularization and so on, on, the, on this data, and using that representation uh, in the hidden layer, it was easy to project this into three dimensions and see different clusters for different types of, uh, of patterns. Uh, of motion patterns in those subjects. So uh, this is an example where we go from a very poor representation and using this unsupervised uh, uh, pre-training of that part of the network, we can obtain a good representation. And now we can simply connect that part of the network that is pre-trained to the rest for doing classification or something like that. And the whole uh, problem becomes much easier to solve. And uh, uh, this also has the, the advantage of uh, working as uh, regularization. This is uh, uh, an example from, from, this, uh, uh, sorry, from uh, this paper um, that uh, what the authors did were to train 50 uh, networks uh, for, this was for the MNIST classification problem, uh, and train them with uh, random initialization or by using that supervised pre-training first, uh, unsupervised, sorry, unsupervised pre-training first. And uh, then what they did was along the, the training uh, of the network, they took the, all the activations of the, of the neurons on the test set and used those activations as a large vector projected into lower dimensions. So this is a, a T-SNE projection and the ESOMAP projection. But what we can see is that with pre-training, the networks start uh, somewhere here and then they move and then start spreading out uh, on this region of the projected uh, set of values. So the, the dark blue are the initial uh, values uh, at the beginning of, of training and then they start going into cyan as, uh, as they reach at uh, the, uh, the end of training, and this shows at different epochs. So this is the cloud of, the, of how the, the 50 different networks spread out. But we can see that without pre-training, they are at a different space of the, um, uh, the landscape of the, the possibilities of parameters. And if we see this with, with ESOMAP, because TSNE does not care very much about long distances, only about the neighborhoods, ESOMAP is better at representing these long distances. And we can see that without pre-training, the training is all spread out in a large region of the, uh, of the parameter space. But with pre-training, they all focus on the same spot here. So the, uh, the networks are all converging more or less to the same space there. Uh, so uh, unsupervised pre-training seems to work not only as regularization, guiding the, uh, the training to a more restricted area of the, the possible combinations of parameters, but it, it also makes the network explore different regions of that space of possible parameters than what happens if we just started uh, at random. So there are cases where unsupervised pre-training may help, but uh, mostly it has this uh, historical imp importance because it was the first practical method for training deep uh, neural networks before using rectified linear units, uh, batch normalization, so on. All of those newer techniques that help uh, uh, no, uh, speed up the training and also techniques like dropout that help with regularization. Um, so. Uh, for small data sets, you can use uh, unsupervised pre-training if you have uh, a large amount of unlabeled data to do pre-training first. That would be a scenario where, where this could be really helpful. But if you only have uh, a small number of examples, then it's better to use other methods uh, than neural networks. One disadvantage of this is that when you have two training stages, it uh, complicates everything, the selection of hyperparameters, optimizers, doing all of those kinds of things uh, becomes more complicated if you first have to do the pre-training and then you have to do the fine-tuning again. 
but there are uh, applications, especially when you have very large uh, data sets that do not have labels, the labels that you want, and then relatively small data sets with the labels that you need for uh, your particular problem. In those cases, for example, natural language processing typically uh, falls into that category. Image, uh, uh, image processing also can have those kinds of examples. In those cases, unsupervised pre-training can be very helpful because it helps you find the correct uh, the best features for, uh, for representing the data before you move on to your supervised uh, learning problems. Okay, so this brings us to transfer learning. Now, there are uh, some uh, differences between different authors in how to categorize this, but the basic idea is that uh, in transfer learning, we have different tasks, but there are some factors that can be shared between them and are important, so, so the kinds of features that we need. This can be lower level features. Uh, for instance, we have networks trained to distinguish between some categories of images like cats and dogs and so on. And we want now to train a network for different categories like horses and donkeys. But the, the low level features, the edges, the shapes, the colors, all of those detecting those patterns are probably the same. So we can do like you did last week, take the first part of the network reuse it as it is and just train another part to uh, do different things with those features. There could be uh, the other way around. We can have the same representations at a higher level and only need to change things at the lower level. For example, in speech recognition, everything that has to do with the structure of sentences and the different words and so on, those higher, higher level patterns should be the same for different speakers of the same language. However, the way each person says the word, so the actual conversion from sound to the different word tokens, those uh, probably change a lot from speaker to speaker. So we may be able to reuse the higher level uh, representations, but have to train the lower level feature extraction. In any case, the idea here for transfer learning, the general idea is that we are reusing something that was already learned in one case and uh, starting from there or applying that directly to uh, a new problem. Now here, uh, authors diverge a bit when they consider uh, domain adaptation, whether if it is a sub example, subclass of transfer learning, or if it's something similar to transfer learning, but different. So I'm not going to commit to either of these opinions, but in your textbook, at least, there is this idea that domain adaptation is not quite the same as transfer learning. Uh, and the idea is that we have the same kind of thing that we're trying to learn, but we are applying it to different domains. For example, we uh, had a model that uh, tried to classify uh, customer reviews in the movie database according to whether the person was happy or angry or sad or something like that about the movie they saw. Uh, and now we want to do the same thing for a, a, an electronics shop where we are selling products and we have the reviews of the products. So this would be a, a different context, a different domain where we are applying. The, the kind of, of text should not be the same when people are reviewing toasters or movies, but the kind of relations between words and if the person is angry or happy should be similar and we are trying to uh, learn the same function, the same kind of mapping, but for a different domain. Um, the um, concept drift would be a, a case where something is changing, but it's a gradual change over time. Uh, this can be what changes can be the way the input maps to the output. For instance, changes in the e economy may change the importance of some factors in uh, assessing credit card risk. For example, uh, if the person has a job or not, the kind of car they drive, things like that. Uh, this can change whether the, the economy is booming and even if the person uh, is currently without a job can easily find a new one or if the economy is contracting and then the importance may be different. Or it may be not because the function is changing but because the distribution of the data is changing. So you start with a, with a small shop 
that has some spe very specific clients that are interested in the things that you're selling, like board games or something like that. And then it becomes very popular and now everyone wants to buy uh, those games. You have uh, more stores and so on. But now the, the customer pool is very different. The distribution is very different and you may have to relearn uh, some things about those uh, that structure. So uh, this would be uh, this uh, um, problem of trying to transfer what you already learned to a new uh, situation. But in the case of concept drift, this is something that is occurring gradually. It's not just going from A to B, you are moving gradually along that, that trajectory. And so you may be, for example, fine tuning your model regularly with new data, or uh, having some way to test if you need to retrain everything from the start, something like that. But this uh, is a specific kind of problem that has different solutions than the others. But in general, the idea of transfer learning, whether you consider these to be different categories or everything to fall under the umbrella of transfer learning and, and just be specific uh, examples, uh, the basic idea is that we are going to use what we learned before to uh, what we are going to do now. And some extreme examples may be when you don't even have to learn anything new. You just use the, the, uh, the model, the, the trained instance of the model that you obtained previously, and you apply to something different. So this could be zero-shot learning. And we have a, 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 an interesting example uh, in this paper, if you, if you want to take a look. Uh, what the authors did was to use unsupervised learning on text uh, to create a, a manifold, so basically an embedding of the, uh, the words. And uh, we have these vectors representing the different words, and the difference between the vectors depends on how closely related the words are or correlated they are in the document. So semantically uh, similar words or, or words that have meanings that usually come together will tend to uh, be close together in this manifold. And then they use supervised learning to map between a set of images to find uh, so that the, the network could classify each image according to the correct word. So this would be an automobile, this would be a horse, things like that. And uh, the, they use supervised learning to uh, do this with this set of examples. Now suppose that we have a new image, for instance, a cat, for which there was no category in the supervised training stage. So there were no images of cats, so never uh, was there an example where the network had to classify something as a cat. But uh, uh, they have a, a way of finding that this image is not inside the manifold of the original images in the training set. So now what they do is try to find the closest point in uh, uh, the corresponding point in the word manifold for this image and then find the closest word to that point. And in this case, it would be cat. So the, the network can classify this new image as a cat, even though there was never during training any image with that uh, classification. So that we are now outside the, the, num the classes that there were in the original training set. And the same thing for the truck and things like that. So this would be an example of zero-shot learning where we are using the what was learned of the distribution of the data and supervised learning on the mapping between different manifolds, the images and the words, in order to be able to classify a new image as an entirely new class that was never found before. So basically, with supervised uh, or unsupervised pre-training, both of them, we can uh, take advantage of previously trained models. In uh, the particular case of supervised pre-training for image uh, classification, you have uh, several of these models available in Keras. I mentioned this uh, in, the, in, the, um, um, uh, in the assignment. I think this... Uh, this link is update, outdated. I don't know if it's still the same link, but if you look for Keras applications, you find the correct link and you have that table with lots of trained uh, models and you can try to experiment with those for the assignment in the, in the optional part. Um, and the idea here is basically uh, that uh, historically we could break down the model into simpler parts, train a few layers of the time uh, at a time and things like that to um, 
overcome the problem of vanishing gradients in the the first steps in training deep neural networks but we can still do that when we have uh, models that were uh, pre-trained on larger data sets or better data sets and we can break them down and experiment with uh, some of their uh, layers to see where are the useful features for our particular problem and then we only need to train a very simple model that takes advantage of those features from the pre-trained models uh, and so it can be used in smaller data sets for example so the exercise for today is just a, a simple exercise because the tutorial for today is also for uh, questions about the assignment. So what you're going to do is to create an autoencoder with the, the banknote data set that you used on the second tutorial for the, the regression problem. Uh, no, sorry, for the, the classification problem. Um, the, you can use this banknote data set and try to reduce from four dimensions to two and then plot the result and you can compare that with, with PCA. <clears throat> so you should try different architectures. Uh, the input remember has a dimension of four. So at the end of your network, you need a layer of dimension four. Since the values are continuous that you're trying to, to predict both in the input and the output, this final layer should, should uh, not have activation. So it should have a linear output. Uh, but then you can create the autoencoder, the symmetric autoencoder in the beginning. So basically this is input of four, output of four, and whatever you want in this uh, butterfly shape uh, at the middle. But the requirement is that the central layer has uh, two neurons so that you reduce everything to two dimensions. Experiment with different architectures, look at the validation error, uh, split, uh, reserve some uh, examples for validation so that you see what happens if you are overfitting. Uh, and also you can check what happens if you don't train the network enough, uh, try with different uh, optimizers. You can experiment with different um, variants of uh, rectified linear units, for example, different activations. This is easy, you just import whatever you want from uh, the layers uh, in Keras and then add the activation that you want. Some of them you may not have the 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 string for uh, putting it right in the in the dense layer. Uh, I don't know if all of them have, but if they don't, you can always use this way and split uh, between the the layer and the activation. So you can experiment a bit with this and try to optimize the the representation that you find at the end. The only tricky thing that you have to do is uh, you need to create a model for the complete autoencoder, but then you also need to create a model with just the encoder. Uh, one way of doing this is to use uh, uh, to give a name to the that middle layer, this one here, where you have the the encoding, and then you extract the outputs from that and you create a new model that just goes from the input to that uh, middle point, uh, middle part of your autoencoder. And this would be the encoder uh, part only, which you can then use to transform your data uh, so that you can plot it, compare it with uh, principal component analysis and so on. So this is the only part that is a bit different from what we've been doing so far, uh, because after training the autoencoder, you need to use only the encoder part. The decoder is just to help us train the, the whole thing. So this would be an example, principal component analysis, and uh, uh, one example of using an autoencoder, depending on the architecture and training and so on, you'll get different examples, but this is just to get a feeling for how these things work. Okay, so we saw uh, this idea of uh, improving learning by first getting the best features, better representations, and this not only serves to help whatever task comes later, because good features are always good, but it can also serve as regularization by guiding uh, the network to start at some uh, specific uh, uh, place. It was historically important before rectified linear units, basically, but it's still uh, very useful whenever you have lots of uh, unlabeled data, or if you have uh, lots of data in a similar problem, from which you can use the same features. So one example would be using those very sophisticated uh, uh, 
networks for image classification and using those as they are already trained to help you solve some problem with a smaller data set. So I recommend reading uh, chapter 15, also this, this section here, but chapter 15 is mostly uh, about this part of representation learning. And also this, uh, this paper, so this is a, a good paper about these concepts and a good discussion of uh, uh, these uh, aspects of learning at a more abstract level without worrying too much about specific implementations, networks and so on. Okay, so that's it for now. I will uh, log into Zoom and we have a few minutes for questions.